Um, so I know doc, talking to Dr. Hassan's team, I know some of the big things he was um, uh, he was looking for in like a in like a file system was and talking to you guys as well is something that's I guess simple to use. So um, similar to what you guys are using, it's a it's a one file system. Um, something that uh, has a lot of structural integrity, so you don't need to worry about uh, file separation or uh, even ledging it over instrumentation, stuff like that. Um, and then also something that was pretty important um, to the team, it sounded like, um, was a something that was multi-use. Um, so you can actually use these for about uh, two to three times. So um, Dr. is gonna, gonna get into it um, for us here is with us. He's gonna just go over kind of like uh, the history of like how control memory files and then how we got to um, the EDM files, which stands for electric discharge machining, um, kind of how we got to this technology, go over some like tips and tricks, um, go over the technique, and then we're going to have a Q&A after for if anybody has any um, specific questions as well. So um, Dr. Gray has actually worked with Colt team for the last, uh, last several years now. He's been an opinion leader for us, and I thought he'd be a really good guy to come on and talk to you guys because he actually used to speak for Densply as well. Uh, I was opinion leader for them before coming over and working with Colt team. So um, I just thought it'd be really good for going over differences if you guys have any sp specific questions. So um, with that, I'll, I'll leave it over to uh, you, Dr. Gray. Well, thanks. I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, out of their busy days. I mean, the last thing you want to do is listen to somebody at eight o'clock at night, but I do appreciate your attention and, and that type of stuff. And so I thought what I'd do is spend a little bit of time to you, with you today and kind of walk you through the history. I don't know. It's, it's so different doing this on, you know, uh, on a Zoom call versus being in front of you so I can kind of gauge the audience and, and see see the differences in age. Uh, for some of those who are fairly new to dentistry, your exposure to our past and, and what we've done with rotary instrumentation may be very limited, where if you're an older uh, clinician like myself who's been around for a number of years, you've seen the whole evolution of rotary instrumentation from the very moment it came onto the market to where we currently are today. So what I thought I would do is, is just um, spend a little bit of time. Let me get this working here. There we go. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a product of Southern California. I went to dental school out at USC, got out in 1990. And uh, from there, I did uh, three years of active duty with the United States Navy and did a general practice residency down at Camp Pendleton in uh, San Diego, California area and then did my additional time with the Navy and, and got out of uh, the Navy and moved to Arizona and basically opened up a, my own family practice from scratch. And so I went out and uh, practiced general dentistry for eight years before I went back to, the, to Southern California and uh, obtained my endodontic certificate. So I understand where you guys are coming from. I understand what it's like to be in the trenches to, you know, to try to fight a strong tongue on number 18, trying to cut a crown prep there. So. Um, I get it. So um, what I want to do is just kind of walk you through a little bit tonight now as, as my transition of becoming an endodont endodontist. I'm a, a board eligible endodontist. I've been practicing endodontist for 20 years. And currently I have my own uh, solo endodontic practice in uh, Virginia. I'm about an hour and a half outside of Washington, D.C. And I'm in the Richmond, Virginia area and um, enjoying myself down into there. So I really kind of want to take you back to the history of nickel titanium and, and I want to show you where we came from so that you understand where we're going to in, in, in the 21st century. So if we go back to 1993, this is basically when rotary instrumentation hit the marketplace. So for those of us who are practicing dentists, you know, we went to dental school, we learned how to clean and shape canals by hand files, you know, we basically hand filed everything. We did cold lateral condensation and we thought we were all pretty good about with that. Well then in 1993, uh, Tulsa Dental Supply, or back then it was just Tulsa Dental Specialist, uh, they launched Profiles. And this is one of the first files that comes onto the marketplace in 1993. And it kind of takes over endodontics, you know, in a sense now we're actually utilizing an instrument that we can put in a handpiece, we can uh, do rotary instrumentation and for any of those of you who've used the original Series 29 profiles, you know what a very slow dragging kind of an instrument it was, but it, it had a very good market share. You also had the race files that were on the market. You had uh, Quantec files, which were John McSpadden files. And then you had Steve Sinia out of San Antonio introduce Lightspeed. And I don't know if you've ever seen Lightspeed files, but they're off the market today, but there were about 18 separate um, 
rotary files, they looked a lot like Kate's glints. And, and the whole idea that Steve uh, used to teach was is to prepare the apical stop uh, in various sizes. And so these various sizes were 18 files. And so, um, yeah, needless to say, we, none of us really used it. <clears throat> and then, so from 1993 all the way up to about 1999, we didn't have really much else come on the marketplace. And it wasn't until uh, Steve Buchanan introduces the, uh, the GT series. So he, he was a big proponent of these continuous taper. And so uh, he and Densply or he and Tulsa got together and they put together this GT file system to uh, introduce his concept of continuous taper. And this was probably one of the fewer file or one of the files, first file systems on the market that actually started to try to do a little bit more with less files. So it wasn't quite as, as many files per se as what the old profiles were, but it was the first step. It was the first system that kind of came on that just wasn't so much a profile. It had a little bit different cut, a little bit different rake. And so uh, they became quite popular in 1999. And again, we didn't really have anything else until about 2001. In 2001, we saw kind of this major shift that starts to occur in nickel titanium. So in 2001, most programs in undergraduate dental school still were not teaching the undergraduates you know, rotary instrumentation. They were still a little concerned about it, still a little nervous about it. They weren't sure if they really, did, if these files really belonged in the hands uh, of the dental students. I know that when I was at SC, we still weren't letting our undergraduate students use rotaries at this stage. You know, we all were using them in the clinic, you know, in, in the grad program, but upstairs uh, in the undergrad program, we still, you know, still kind of taboo. We'd let them play with them in, in, the, uh, sim, in, in the sims, you know, um, but not so much on the clinic floor. But anyway, so, so ProTaper is introduced in 2001. This is one of the very first files now that is, uh, again, a Tulsa product. It's a little more aggressive. It, uh, it cuts and cleans much faster than what the profiles, you know, were cutting. And um, at the same time that, pro, that ProTaper gets launched, you had Kerr come along and introduce the K3 files. K3 files were were uh, very similar to the profiles. They were uh, a, con a continuous taper, tradition 04, 06 type of a taper with an ISO tip. Whereas the pro tapers, this is one of the very first files on the market that had this variable taper to it. It, it wasn't the standardized ISO tipping all, like what we were so accustomed to using. And when pro tapers were very first launched, Tulsa only really marketed to the endodontist because they were that aggressive. That the tip was a cutting tip. It was not. It was a non. It was not a non-cutting tip. So you had to be very careful when you're at the uh, working link, especially you know in the apical foramina, because they were prone to zipping and transporting and all that other type of thing. But the major problem that pro taper files had were they were a very stiff file, and so once you got into that. Um, F3 type of a, a file, you know, you found that it was just really stiff. It was like trying to put a log down a canal. It just didn't like to, to, to move very much. And so, you know, after listening to um, a lot of uh, endodontists complain, Tulsa went back out and they reformulated the file and they relaunched it. So Cliff Ruddle and uh, uh, West and the rest of them got together and they relaunched the file uh, under the name ProTaper Universal in 2003. And, and basically what they did is they took a little bit out of the inner core of the diameter to make them a little bit more flexible because you remember with files, the, the smaller your, your internal core diameter of a file is, the more flexible it is. And so that's what they did. And so in 2003, this file really takes off. And now Tulsa starts to market it to general dentists and they start to basically market to anybody who will buy it. And this file becomes so popular that it really takes over the marketplace. And they probably had about an 80% market share um, throughout the world on this one particular file, this ProTaper Universal. And it wasn't until four years later that basically we had the launch of different file systems that would come out. And so in 2007, you had Brassler introduced the endo sequence files. Again, this was an o, this was an 04 continuous taper ISO tip size, and um, they launched that in 2007. Well, because of the way commerce is, um, Densply Tulsa did not want to lose any market share to occur, so then they in turn launched Vortex, and that file was launched to very specifically compete against the endo sequence file. And so, 
now we're starting to see a few more files start to come on the marketplace. And here we are in 2007, almost 14 years later from the time that they launched profiles, the ISOs, uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the Series 29, you know, here we are 14 years later, and now we're starting to see a series of files start, kind of starting to come out on the marketplace. Not much comes along, so literally five years. There's nothing between 2007 to up to 2001 where we really see any new file system that comes out. Well, in 2001, Tulsa Densply now starts to launch Wave. And this was basically a file that was a modified uh, ProTaper Universal series, but what they had done was is they had um, modified it so that they could use this in reciprocation. And this was basically Sergio Cutler and Ben Johnson's file that they kind of marketed. And this all came about due to some research that was being done out of, out of um, Singapore uh, on, on uh, a, a young man that was out there doing his PhD um, decided that he was going to take an F2 and he would take an old DTC motor from a septical and, and take it from continuous rotation and make it into a reciprocation. So he changes the motor, he uses the F2 file and he figures out, oh, you know what? I can kind of clean and shape a lot of cases utilizing just one file, which was the, the modified F2 file. And so that's really how the wave file came about the marketplace. You know, we've talked about reciprocation for decades. And it, it kind of like is a flavor of the week sometimes. It kind of comes and goes. Well, Wave really kind of took off in 2001 because this is what Tulsa Dental was pushing into the marketplace and say, hey, we're going to all go reciprocation. Well, at the same time that they start to launch Wave, there's this change, there's this very dynamic change that occurs in rotary instrumentation with the introduction of a metal that has been termed controlled memory. And that was launched in 2001. And that particular control memory file was launched by Colting uh, out of Switzerland and uh, they launched a file called the HyFlex control memory file. And then again, utilizing some different changes, still utilizing control memory, they launched uh, what we term HyFlex EDM and that launch took place in 2015. So what I want to do is kind of walk you down the path a little bit so that you understand the metallurgy of how we got to where we are today. And so if you, I like to break these down into a generational thing, because we all tend to understand the different generations of things. So when I talk first generation, I talk like this is old school. You know, this is what was first on the marketplace. This was introduced in 1993. This, these file systems are still on the marketplace today. More importantly, the metallurgy of this particular file system is still a prevalent metal that's still on the market that is still being used today. And most of the major players that utilize what I call first generation nickel titanium are your profiles, your races, your pro taper systems, the, the K3s. You can, you can read all of these. Uh, the Hero is a European type of a model. And, um, you know, and since 2013, we've seen a, a big launch of what I call knockoff files because Tulsa Densply lost patents in 2013. So the marketplace has been flooded with a, a bunch of files that I can't even keep up with because every time you turn around, there's a new file coming out. But a majority of these new files are still launched with first generation nickel titanium. So I like to use that term old school. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind a little bit. And it took from, 2000, from 1993, basically all the way to 2007 before we saw any changes in the metallurgy itself. So in 2007, Densply launches a metal that they term M-Wire. And so they start thinking, hey, you know what? How can we get nickel titanium a little bit more flexible? Well, maybe we can heat treat it a little bit, try to play with it a little bit, see if we can get some more flex. So they launch M-Wire. And when they redid a lot of their uh, file systems, Steve Buchanan, you know, rebranded the GT series and he wanted to launch uh, a modified GT, but he wanted it in this M wire. And then when Densply uh, Tulsa um, launched the Profile Vortex and the ProTaper Next system, Next is, is, is one of uh, Cliff Ruddle's file systems. They launched it out of this uh, M wire. And so now you've got a wire that's a little bit more flexible, but still pretty, pretty rigid, but it's got a little bit more flexibility than the first generation. Well, 
you know, it's all about market share. It's all about, you know, who can control the marketplace. So in the, in, um, Kerr's answer to Den Supply's launch of the M wire was what they termed their R phase nickel titanium. So this was a third generation wire that again was heat treated. They're looking for more flexibility and they came out and they launch their twisted file system and their K3XF system on this third generation um, nickel titanium. So I really want you to stop and think generations one, two, and three. I, I still like to kind of call these old school nickel titanium. They're workhorses. They've been around for a long time. A majority of you might have even learned utilizing one of these three file systems. But let's really kind of talk about where we are kind of today. And this is with what I term fourth generation. And this is when control memory nickel titanium was launched on the marketplace. So in 2001, you had Colt team launched high flex controlled memory system. You had Typhoon come along and utilize um, a controlled memory wire and they launched Typhoon. Most of you have all heard of Edge Endo. They're, they're kind of becoming fairly large in a sense, but this is one of their file systems that they have where they have a controlled memory type of a file as well as this, the uh, 10 series, uh, again, European type of, of file. And these, these are the predominant what I call control memory files that are on the marketplace. There's a lot of stuff that comes out that are heat treated and they talk in terms of blue and gold and all these different things. But these types of wires are not true controlled memory wire. They're just merely heat treated. <clears throat> well, it took Densply two years to kind of figure out, well, you know, maybe the market is starting to shift towards this more flexible uh, memory type of wire. So let's launch a, a wire that we're going to call ProTaper Gold, which has uh, many of the same properties of a controlled memory uh, nickel titanium. It may not be a true controlled memory, but it's, it's more flexible than anything that, that Tulsa had ever launched before. And it took them almost four years before they finally launched the Wave Gold in a controlled memory type of wire. And then the fifth generation that I like to talk about is what we call high or the EDM wire. This is, uh, was launched in 2015. It's still controlled, um, controlled memory nickel titanium, but it's processed different. And because of that way it's processed, that has changed a little bit of its cyclic fatigue and flexibility of this file. So, you know, just in thinking about this, we've talked about generations one, two, and three, kind of old school. We had a shift in the marketplace in 2011 when, we, when control memory files were launched. So now we're starting to see files that have got a lot more flexibility to where we are today currently with the fifth generation in this EDM. And this EDM is starting to take off. You're actually, I'm actually starting to see more EDM type files coming from Europe that haven't made it to the States or to Canada yet, but they're definitely being prevalent in some of the, um, uh, European countries. So think about this. These were the first four, four files that uh, systems that were on the marketplace that we got to play with in 1993. But if you really kind of stop and think about it today, there are so many different file systems that are coming onto the marketplace. I can't even write enough to put them all on the, the screen because every time I turn around, there's a new file system that comes off. Files are copied, unfortunately, today. If, if you go to a European meeting, I can walk the floors uh, in, in some of these European meetings and see uh, file systems from Asian countries that um, I've never even heard of, but I can tell by looking at the file who they copied. So there's a lot of files on the market. We'll all tend to agree pretty much. We, we pretty much do everything rotary today, which is, is of a great benefit. So when we stop and we think about how we use nickel titanium in, in dental use today, and if we think about comparing both nickel titanium and stainless steel, there are definitely advantages of nickel titanium. We know we finally have a metal that's a lot more flexible than what the stainless steel hand files were. And more importantly, now I've got a metal that I can use inside of a canal that can follow a curved canal because let's face it, root canals and canals of teeth are not straight by any means. And there's a lots of curvatures, there's S shapes, there's all kinds of different shapes to the insides of these anatomies of these teeth. So now I've got a, a, a metal that now can follow majority of these canals and these curvatures. But more importantly, I can put this thing on my handpiece and I don't 
I have to wear my fingertips out anymore. I mean, I still have calluses on my, my index and my thumb finger from all of the hand filing that I've done, but it's so nice not to be able to have to do a lot of that anymore today. But more importantly, with the advent of nickel titanium, we saw this development of newer tech endodontic techniques because most of us learned if we learned hand filing, we had to do the old step back and, uh, you know, you go to working length and you'd step it back and, and then you would have to you rasp and shape the canal to get your links. But now we can go in and we can do what we call this crown down technique. And many of you may have heard of this where you start from larger and you work your work your way down to smaller. But the, with anything, there's always disadvantages to nickel titanium, of course. You know, unfortunately, you know, the manufacturing costs of, of fabricating these files is a lot more than just taking a uh, a stainless steel wire and twisting it to create a, a, a K file or a headstrom or something of that nature. So there's definitely a, a lot higher uh, cost of the materials, the manufacturing of them. More importantly, one of the problems that we really have with rotary instrumentation is, is that due to the generations one, two, and three, you know, a nickel titanium file likes to bend or go straight again. We may be able to bend it and flex it, but it always likes to return to straight. And because of that, with generations one, two, and three, we find that we have a more difficult time trying to stay centered with inside of the canal system. And that leads to ledging and apical transportation, perfing, zipping, you know, um, these are all very common things because this file wants to go straight while we're using it. And of course the dreaded separation, that's, that's, uh, that, that'll ruin a day real quick. And, and I always, whenever I'm lecturing throughout the world and, and I always have somebody that comes up to me and they'll say, well, you know, I've never broken a file, you know, when I doing, you know, endodontics. And, and my response to them is then you haven't done enough endodontics because I guarantee it, all of us have separated a file at one time or another and, and it'll ruin your day. And it, it absolutely ruins my day when it occurs. So let's go back in time a little bit. I want you to kind of see where nickel titanium come from, came from. So William Bueller, 1962, we term him as the father basically of, of nickel titanium. And he was uh, working in the space industry and they were trying to come up together or trying to come together with this shape memory alloy that they could use within the space race. And so it was his team that actually created this nickel titanium that they wanted to try to use in the space race itself. And when you think about how we call it and what we call it, it realistically was discovered in Maryland at, at the uh, Naval Ordnance Laboratory. That's where we're, William Bueller and his team were working at. And they basically put together this composition of metal that was a 55% weight nickel and a 45% titanium. So therefore we call this nickel titanium or nitide based upon where it was discovered at. So it was nickel titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory which basically means night knock. This is what we call this metal. This is what we, this is the technical term for this metal, this nickel titanium, we, we call it night knock. Well, what is night knock? Night knock itself is a metal that has the ability to form two crystallographic phases. So this is the physics part. So I, I hopefully don't want to lose you in this because I know what physics was like for me in undergrad. It wasn't my strongest subject. But I want you to kind of get an idea of how these metals work and bend so that we can use them in, in, in endodontics. So when we talk in terms of nickel titanium, we talk about these two phases. And these two phases we, we call marstonite and austenite. And so austenite is this high temperature phase of the nickel titanium. So when nickel titanium is, reaches this high temperature, it converts to this austenite phase. And then we have this marstonite phase, which is a low temperature of this metal. So let's really kind of break this down a little bit. So let's go to austenite first. So if you look at austenite, austenite is this complex body-centered cuboidal type of structure. And, and it's a very rigid structure. And you'll notice that the nickel, you know, is all around the titanium. And it's just this real rigid phase. Well, this phase of the metal occurs with high temperatures or low stress. So in order to get nickel, to get nitinol to convert to an austenite phase, you have to cook it at a high temperature, which will convert it into this austenite phase, or 
you'll notice that if you take a file out of the box when you first get it and say it's a pro taper file and you put it on the countertop that's under low stress and so that file is under low stress so it's in an austenite phase okay marstenite is a different phase of this metal and marstenite is this more kind of loosey-goosey type of a structure it's not as rigid as what the austenite phase was and and you'll have titanium and nickel interspersed throughout each other and it's this monoclinic type of a structure and what's interesting about this phase of the metal this exists at high stress and or low temperatures okay and this will all make sense to you pretty quick so basically if i get nickel titanium from the laboratory or nitinol i have to do something with it because if it's at a low temperature nitinol just in itself in a true nitinol or, or not excuse me in a true austenite phase or a marcenite phase nitinol is a very soft it's very easy to deform i really cannot use this in rotary instrumentation it's like lead in the sense that you can just it's too malleable it's too soft so I have to do something to this metal in order for me to use it in rotary instrumentation. So I have to take this marcenite phase and I have to heat it. And this high temperature, generally above 500 degrees Celsius, will cause nitinol to convert from a pure marcenite phase into this austenite phase. And this is where this, this metal becomes more rigid now. And it's through the heating of the metal that it changes the molecular structure. And now we have this more rigid metal. And so at this high temperature, we use this to train nitinol to remember its specific austenite phase or shape. So that's why when you take a file out of a box, it is not all soft and loosey goosey, but it is basically rigid. If you take any of the old profiles, pro tapers, twisted files, whatever they might be, you can bend them and let go of them and they'll return back to its original straight shape. And that is an austenite phase. And so when they heat the metal up, they train it to remember this shape. So when this metal cools down, it'll still stay straight. It'll still remember that phase. So this is kind of a cool little thing. This is what I'm talking about. So this is out of University of Washington and this is nitinol and they're actually converting it right there in front of your eyes to a more rigid austenite phase. So they can put it on in, in high temperatures, they'll, they'll get the molecular structures to convert, they'll go rigid, and then that rigidity stays once uh, they remove it from the, the, the temperature and let it cool down. But if we were to take austenite just by itself in a straight rigid phase, we can't really use it in nickel tight, or we can't use it in rotary instrumentation. Nitinol is unique because we have both properties of austenite and marstenite with inside of the metal itself. So the reason that an austenite file, such as a, a twisted file, can bend and follow curvature of canals is due to what we call stress-induced marstenite. And that's basically, if you were to take a file and put it in between your fingertips and you apply pressure to bend it, at the point of the bend or the top of that horseshoe, you're actually forcing nitinol to convert from an austenite phase into a marstenite phase. Because remember, we talked that marstenite can exist at high stress and low temperatures. So the fact that you bend a wire and you get this arch shape into it, that's the stress, that's the high stress that takes austenite and converts it to this marstenite phase. And that's realistically why a metal can, or why a file will bend and we can use it inside of a canal. And it, it typically can follow the curvature of the canals because we're stressing this file as we're working with it and we're actually taking the metallurgy and we're making it convert from an austenite phase to a marstenite phase and back and forth. And this is just the graph, if, if, if you really want to kind of see it, don't ask me to explain it because that was 30 plus years ago. <clears throat> but this is, this is a better way to understand it, okay? So nitinol itself is really flexible. We can easily deform it in low temperatures. So if I have a low temperature, I can convert austenite into a marstenite phase. So this is kind of a cool party trick. So if you take a little Petri dish 
and you basically have your straight file. And if, if I bend it, meaning that if I go in and I put pressure on it and I bend it, and then I take a, like endo ice, in Europe they use endo frost, and I cool that point at the bend, I can actually take a file and put it in a marcenite phase at the bend and it'll hold that phase for a little bit till it warms back up. And so this is what I'm talking about. So this is my office. So you've got a straight austenite file. You can see it flex. So I wanna just isolate the marstenite phase of the file. So I bend it, I can cool it. And now I've got a file that is in a marstenite phase until it warms back up. And as it warms back up, it now converts back into the austenite phase. So that's the metallurgy when we talk about generations one, two, and three. That's why these files bend and, and they were able to follow canals, but you gotta always remember, you're putting a rotary instrument inside of a canal, no matter what you do to stress it, it always wants to go straight. And so that's where we have to be careful. That's why we can't spend a lot of time inside of a canal system with a one, two, or three generation file because they're gonna wanna go straight on you. So nickel titanium is really kind of cool because now we've talked about these crystallographic phases, but there's all these properties that, that are tied up into nickel titanium. And, and nitinol itself has these two extraordinary properties with it as well. There's this one property that we term pseudo or super elasticity, and there's this other that we term shape memory. And so what is the super elasticity? Well, this is the ability to put energy into something and get it to where we can stretch the molecular chain. So, you know, here, here's Kevin pulling a, a nice big piece of, of, of um, rubber dam. And, and if he were to take a regular piece of rubber dam and he puts energy into it and he pulls that thing apart, you know, he can stretch the molecular chains. And as soon as he lets go of that, it'll return back to its usual shape. The same thing with this little slinky toys that we may have played with as kids. But the whole key to super elasticity is once you release the load, that material returns back to the original shape. Again, think of the, think of the night tie. You can bend it, you let go of it, it returns back to its original shape. So the advantages of this train shape and what it brings to nickel titanium really is the ability to distinguish between different forms of deformation. Okay, and so what do I mean by that? So we talked elasticity. Well, within the elasticity model, we have deformation. And one form of deformation we call elastic deformation. And again, elastic deformation is basically a reversible process. You put energy into something, it'll bend it, you take the energy away, it returns back to normal. Think of the windy days and the trees. We've all watched them blow. And then when the wind stops, they stand back up. Same thing, slinkies, all those types of things. This particular method is completely reversible, okay? But another form of deformation is called plastic deformation. And plastic deformation is irreversible. This is when you change the molecular structure to the point it doesn't recover. So we've all done this. We've taken the paper clips, we've played with it, we've worked them back and forth to where they eventually break. That is a form of plastic deformation. So why is this important? Why do we want to be able to distinguish between elastic and plastic deformation? Well, it's because of this. It's that unexpected fracture that occurs. And the problem that we have is, is that files, if we plastically deform a file, they'll break. The problem is, is because of the super elasticity component of the nickel titanium, it will mask that plastic deformation. So you cannot visually see that deformation occur in generations one through three. So is it possible that we could differentiate between an elastically or plastically deformed nickel titanium? Absolutely. And that's when you give what we term true shape memory properties to the material itself. I'm not talking train shape because, you know, train shape is a different thing. Training, a train shape is, is training that nickel titanium to, into an austenite phase. But now we're going to start talking in terms of true shape memory, okay? So what is it that we do to train a metal or any material to remember a specific shape? Well, if I have a shape and if I deform that shape, I can get a new shape. 
And if I change the conditions of that shape, I can get it to convert back to the original shape. These are the processes that we do to train material to remember shapes. And things that we use uh, in science are either temperature or pressure or magnetism or chemical abilities. These are all the different things that we use. As clinicians, I want you to think in terms of temperature because in terms of temperature, that's what we use in our world, okay? So training in particular shape. So if I have a specific shape, such as a file, this file has a particular shape to it. If I deform this file through usage to where it now deforms and it looks a little different, if I change the conditions, such as an autoclave oven, I want to get that file to return back to the original shape. That's train memory. If I can get it to return to that shape, great. But if the shape doesn't return and I have a file that stays plastically deformed, now I have something that I have a visual to say, hmm, if I use that particular file again, I run a very high probability that that file is going to fracture. And that's what's unique about training material and having shape memory. So let's talk about controlled memory and where we get this term and everything else. So this is Dr. Barbara. Um, and, and Barbara is at um, Langenau, Germany, and she's with Cole team. And um, Barbara is, Barbara and her team were the ones who were instrumental in formulating um, nickel titanium. So Barbara Mueller's her name. So she's got her PhD actually in metallurgy out of Georgia Tech. And so her team discovers this particular metal. We've seen different companies throughout time trying to come up with shape memory or, or trying to come up with heat treated type of materials, but Barbara actually coins the term controlled memory. And so this is, the Colt team was the first company to launch a controlled memory nickel titanium file on the marketplace. But if you stop and think about how many files that now are on the marketplace that are all claiming to have some type of controlled memory and, and utilizing even the term controlled memory, you know, what, a, uh, what an honor. You know, I mean, if, if they're going to copy you and, and use the names and stuff, I mean, it, it is. It's, it's, it's flattering and, and it's great because now there's this big movement that has taken over endodontics to where now we're starting to talk heat treatment and we're starting to talk controlled memory. And every time I turn around, there's a new uh, file that comes on the marketplace today that, that is talking about these benefits of controlled memory. So let's really talk about what controlled memory nickel titanium is. Nickel, controlled memory nickel titanium has a lot of benefits and there are reasons that we want to use a controlled memory file today versus one of the older first, second, or third generation files. Part of the biggest reason that I use a controlled memory file is just due to the superior canal tracking ability of nickel titanium. Um, in a controlled memory file that has that's fabricated out of controlled memory doesn't want to go straight all the time. So now I get some of those forces that are forcing the file to always try to straighten out on me. Those are removed. And so now I can take a file and I can keep it more centered within my canal space. And I don't worry about transporting or zipping uh, cases near like, you know, what we had in the past. The other key thing is, is that because of the properties of controlled memory and the ability to train a file or train a metal to remember specific shapes, that brings about these regenerative properties. And again, changing the conditions. And we've also found that by heat treating nickel titanium and fabricating controlled memory, that has increased our fatigue resistance of these particular files over generations one, two, and three. So let's talk about con con superior canal tracking. Now, let's face it, any, any company that produces any type of a file, they're always gonna keep some things proprietary for themselves. And so this is one of the things. So it's basically the way that they heat treat these is a proprietary process. But the key is, is that you now have a file that will take a shape at, at, at room temperature, any given shape. So if I take a file and if I put a little pressure on it and I remove that pressure, I have a file that will still remember that shape. Again, We've all seen the old common nickel titanium generations one through three. We put it in a, in a case, we can bend it. If we take the file out, it returns to straight. Whereas if a control memory file, we can bend it, we can pull it out. And that file, oops, excuse me, let me go back. That file will keep 
the bend and it'll remember that shape. Well, in endodontics, we, we always put out literature to, to support what we are putting out on the marketplace. And so anytime you introduce a new product, a new metal, any new way of thinking, you always have to justify what you're trying to do in the literature. So some of the early research, this is Testarelli's paper in uh, Journal of Endodontics 2011. And basically he puts out a paper. So this is at the very forefront of introducing controlled memory. He has 10 files. They're in a grouping of 25, they're 06 taper. And he wanted to compare the stiffness in bending uh, at 45 degrees. And so you have to bend these and you have to test them against the conventional files that are on the marketplace, generations one, two, and three. Now you're gonna take a generation four file and you're gonna compare them against the first three generations. And, and Testarelli found that his analysis that the control memory files were to be far more flexible with a significant difference when you compare them to the other files. And the files that he used, let's, let's go back. The files that he used, uh, he compared them to EndoSequence, the Profile, Hero, and FlexMaster. And so he concluded that the results of his present study showed uh, an increased flexibility, this new nickel titanium alloy over conventional nickel titanium. And so when you look in terms, the lower the number is what you really want for your value. In regenerative properties, when we talk about regenerative properties, Controlled memory, no matter whose controlled memory file you use or play with, they anytime that you a file it, um, is, encounters some resistance, you're going to get this slight opening of the spirals. Now, the file doesn't get longer, but the file slightly open a little bit. And that's important because that avoids binding to the walls. This helps reduce your fracture rate. So your controlled memory files are kind of all trained to do this. They tend to open it up. But if you've never used this type of a file, the first time you see that happen, it kind of freaks you out a little bit because you're not used to seeing that. The, the key to this, you can continue to use this file. I still all the time. I just know that internally, oh, you know what? It was binding a little bit. So it's going to open it up to relieve that, that bind. So therefore, I'm not going to fracture my file. And again, going back, these are some Al Sudini's uh, studies from 2014 uh, where he basically shows in figure one he shows uh, an SEM scan basically of the brand new file he he works it he he flexes the file he gets some resistance on it he goes back in and they autoclave them they you know they introduce uh, the heat to get it to regenerate and the fi figure three shows where that file basically has regenerated back to the same size uh, and same, back to the same shape and that's important because you always want your file to recover. And so if I take a file and I put some pressure on it, I bend it, I'm gonna regenerate it. Just, this is just hot water. And this is Dr. Uh, Padula out of Italy. And so you can see, I want it to recover. If this file doesn't recover when I've autoclaved it or regenerated it, guess what? I've got a sign of plastic deformation. I don't wanna use this file again if it doesn't fully recover. So why is that important for us? Because with controlled memory files that are regenerated by thermal treatment, it means multiple uses. So now you have a company that comes out and says, guess what? We want you to use this file more than once. I use my files more than once, okay? And the key is, is regenerate the file, autoclave it. Look at it closely before you use it again. If the file hasn't fully recovered and you see some opening of the flutes or maybe it's, it's, you know, didn't recover from a bend or something like that, that's your clinical indication to take the file and pitch it. So let's now talk about some of the uh, fatigue resistance. Again, Shin. Now, Shin is, she's out of UAB over there in Vancouver. And so she's, she's done a lot of uh, uh, early controlled memory research and, and her particular study, now she increases the number. And so once you can establish yourself in the literature, you do it with a small sample size. And then as you get validity of that research, then you will start to increase your sample size. So now it becomes repeatable. So she and she takes 120 of these conventional controlled memory files and regular conventional files. And she, again, she tests them at curvatures of 35 and 45. And she finds 
that the nickel titanium instruments that are made from controlled memory now are between 300 to 800% more resistant to fatigue failure than instruments made from the conventional MITI wire generations one through three. And so, you know, she puts them in, she can basically, this is what the device looks like. You put your file in, you can create the kind of bend by adjusting B and that changes your bend and your thing. But, you know, her results found, you know, she was way above for cyclic fatigue over the conventional files. And so that starts that process where we start talking about, oh, you know, we've discovered that controlled memory now has a greater cyclic fatigue. So what does that mean? Cyclic fatigue is how many times you can spin a file before it separates on you. Uh, Al Sudini, you know, you guys can read all of this, but I think the key that he really brings out in this study, um, Al Sudini basically comes out and he says, listen, with controlled memory files, because of the way that they're processed, now you have this extremely flexible file that doesn't have the shape memory of generations one, two, and three. But more importantly, you have a file that you can utilize that has characteristics of a marstonite phase or what they call marstonite active file with shape memory. Because you can't use a true marstonite total file because you just, they're too soft. So it has to be an austenite file. But if you process them in such a way, you can change the molecular structure to the point where you can get it to mimic more of an austenite phase, but in a, uh, of a marcinite phase, but in a usable phase. And that's what Al Sudini was basically stating in this, this uh, study of his. So why is this all important? And why does this nickel titanium, you know, why, why is it important? Austenite, marcinite, increased fracture resistance, you know, what is all this? It really boils down to the, the crystallographic phases that we talked about and how do the molecular structures line up and, and it's the way that the molecular structures of the metal line up that gives us our flexibility, creating our shape memory. So what about, we get this all the time, how often can I use these files and, and you know, that type of thing. You know, you guys are the clinicians. So however you use the files and how often you use it, you're the clinicians and you have to make that choice. I will tell you, if you have a brand new file, you use it, you stress it, you autoclave it, and if it doesn't return back to the original shape, that's your indication to get rid of the file and don't use it. Now, I'm never gonna sit there and tell you how many times you use a file, because again, that's your particular realm. You know, I can say I kind of use mine comfortably in three cases, but I use them differently. Um, I may not use a, a, a case I have used a couple of times on a really calcified curve case, but this is, what nickel titanium, this is what controlled memory can do for us. I mean, we, it was challenging to make these types of turns and these types of curvatures with a standard nickel titanium generations one through, one through three file, but it's very easy to make these types of turns today with uh, a third gener or fourth, fifth generation file. So that talks about fifth generation, that's next generation. And this is really what the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about comes down to of high flex EDM. So if you think about this, high flex CM files are every file generations one through four, regardless, are all created by a milling process. And they take a blank wire, they, it looks like piano wire, it's on a great big huge spool and they run it through these machines and they have all these different grinding wheels on it. And based upon the rotations and the angles and the pitches of the wheels is what creates your particular file itself, okay? So this grinding process creates the fluting, creates the shape of the file, and that's how we have all of our hand files and stuff that we use on the market today, generations one through four. Well, what's unique about generation five in EDM, these files aren't pulled through a machine and ground, their shape is created through electrical discharge machining. So think spark erosion. They have a wire and the wire itself is sparked through electrical sparks and it's that sparking that creates the actual shape of the file itself. <clears throat> so with EDM, you can tell by looking immediately that the files are gonna look different. If you compare a, a high flex control memory file, the CM files with the EDM files, you'll notice one has a nice shiny appearance and the other looks more like kind of a moon crater. So let's go and let's look at Shara's studies from, um, from 2015. So Shara takes 
these studies and she throws them under SCM. And so she's actually looking at the surface under SCM. And so in, in the one micrograph you can see where it really looks a lot like a moon crater. And all of these little pits and valleys that you're seeing is actually locations of where each spark hit the file blank itself. And that's what created the shape, how much spark goes into it, you know, and it is, is how much evaporates from that file shank itself. What Shar found, you know, and I will go through this a little bit later, is that she found that this particular surface of the file, though, led to an increased higher surface hardness as well as a higher cutting efficiency. So let's talk a little bit about this, what we term the one file. So I always kind of get cautious when I hear the term I can use and, and do endodontics with basically one file. I'm going to tell you guys you, and girls, you really cannot. But we like to do things easier and simpler. And if that were the case, Wave, you know, has got seven files now from the original three. Well, we call this the one file because in some cases, if you wanted to do less cleaning and shaping per se, you can get away with it a little bit more with this particular one file. This is the workhorse of the entire EDM system, in my opinion. What's unique about the, the one file, it's constructed with a variable taper and, and that helps to reduce the breakage. So what do I mean by that? Well, in D0 to D5, and D0 is the very tip, and you count up five millimeters from the tip, the shape of the file is this cuboidal type of a shape. And that's done for strength, okay? So from D0 to D5, you're at an 08 taper. And you think, oh my gosh, 08, but no. It, it's done for strength because once you transition to D6, now you start to get into this trapezoidal type of a look and that is due to flexibility. And so from D6, working your way up the file, it will actually change shapes. And so by the time you get to D16, which is the top of the fluting system, that D16 has more of a triangular shape. Well, what's so unique about this is you cannot create variable shapes in one file by grinding it and pulling it through a machine. The only method that you can create variable shapes with inside a one file system is due to EDM processing and changing the computer at particular points along the, the way up the file to create different types of shape. And that's what is so unique about EDM. So you have the ability to take a wire and create various shapes to give you strength and flexibility all within one file system. EDM has all the same benefits that I talked about earlier. It all has the same superior canal tracking, the regenerative properties, the uh, fatigue resistance, because it's made out of the same wire of controlled memory. It's just processed differently after the heat treatment occurs to give it the controlled memory. So again, we've talked about regenerative properties. The key is, if I flex a file, this is really kind of cool. This is Alfredo out of Italy. And so he's going to take one file. It's been flexed a little bit and it's, and it's opened up just a bit, but he's going to apply heat. He's going to regenerate the file. You're going to actually watch the whole file regenerate right in front of your eyes there. And this is what you want. So if you feel like you're using a file and it maybe doesn't behave the way that you want to, pick up your, your touch and heat or system B, you can regenerate it right there chair side. I've done that on occasion to make sure the file recovers if I question it. So if I'm using the file and I'm questioning, hmm, I'm not sure, let me regenerate it and it recovers, okay, I'm gonna keep using it. And it didn't recover, I'm gonna toss it and get a new one. Let's go back to Prani's study. This is 2015, and she wanted to evaluate the surface structure of these new high-flex EDM files and test them in their fatigue resistance. And so, you know, again, small study group because this is the first study on the market with EDM files. So she takes 10, uh, she takes 15 high-flex EDM files, and she uses them in 10 separate canals, and she runs them at 500 RPMs at a 2.5 torque. And what she found was is that her EDM files gave her up to a 700% higher breakage resistance over just the high flex CM. So if you look at the chart and the graph, you'll see that the purple and the red are traditional CM files. But look at the difference in, in cyclic fatigue values um, that she was able to generate over with the EDM over the CMs. 
And so that's why, to me, my EDMs, I kind of use them on like 98% of most of my cases today, just because I'm comfortable with the cyclic fatigue, the amount of times that it can cycle before uh, separation. Padula follows up her study now, and, and he wants to increase the size again. It's all about increasing the sizes. And so again, he's going to take 120 of these. He wants to test them against the files that are um, a wave one and reciprocal, and he wants to, to test them at curvatures and three millimeters radius of curvature. And his charting, again, confirms what Shara was able to say as well, that the EDM files have a much higher cyclic fatigue value over some of the other more traditional popular files on the market today. So we come right out and we'll, we'll, we'll say point blank, there's enough research on the market or out, in, out there today that, that justifies us by saying that control memory files have up to 300% higher breakage resistance when you compare them to generations one, two, and three nickel titanium. And if you go into generation five now with EDM, now you can expect up to a 700% more cyclic fatigue breakage resistance, just comparing them to the CM files. That's, pretty, that's a pretty bold statement, but it's a true statement. So what's cool about e the EDM system is that you can very easily and very routinely do great cases with fewer files. And, and I'm gonna be really honest with you. I do most of my cases with pretty much three files today. And so if you have a pretty straightforward case without a lot of curvature, you could very easily go in with an orifice opener, take a hand file, get your, you know, you always wanna scout your, your cases, uh, eight, 10, 15, get your hand file in there, get your working link. You can, you can take the glide path file, the 1005 to working link and easily shape it with a 2505 or with the 2508 or the one file and a lot of times you can finish some of the cases with that now i always get a little cautious because i know that the distal roots are lower molars and the palatal roots of upper uh, molars they tend to be a little bit bigger than just stopping with a um, a high flex uh, one file i typically will finish mine with the 4004 or 5003 um, so this is the basic file system itself. You have an orifice opener, which is basically it's a 2512. This is basically in, used in the coronal two thirds. You're just trying to clear out the coronal portion. So this is the first file that I typically use. I go in with this file. I always go 18 and 15 first before I put anything rotary in a, in a tooth. And as soon as I clear and scout my canals and I'll go in with this access file, I'll open it up just a little bit to clear debris, pulp tissue, whatever it might be. The first file in the system that you would utilize is your glide path file, it's your 1005. After you get your working link, you can take this file straight down into your working link. You can follow that up with a preparation file, which is a 2005. And then you can shape, finish your shaping with the one file, the 2508. And on some of the cases, so a lot of your uh, buckle roots of your upper molars, your mesial roots of your lower molars, you can very easily finish these at a 2508. But there are finishing files with this system as well. And, and you'll see that there's a 4004, a 5003, and a 6002. I will tell you in my hands, I personally finish a lot of my cases with a, to a 4004 and a 5003 because to, to go from a 2508 one file and to finish it with a 4004 takes about two seconds. <coughs> Pardon me. And that's because if you guys are probably all looking at the fact you go, oh, 25 ISO tip and a 40 ISO tip, there's no way that they'll make that jump. But what you're forgetting to do is you're looking at the taper. And so the, the difference in taper from an 08 to an 04 is half. And so realistically, the 4004 file really is only cleaning about the last half a millimeter of the working length. So I just feel more comfortable in my hands where I typically finish pretty much most of my cases with a 4004 and a 5003 in the larger roots. Now, in my hands, I routinely will pick up the 2005 as my first file and I'll generally use three files. I'll go 20, the 25 and the 40 and I'm using three files to finish the majority of my cases. Now, we say that the finishing files are optional, but you know what? Younger patients have bigger canals. And so, you know, I think it's important that you have some of these larger finishing files on hand. So what are our recommendations for usage? So 
with a glide path file, that's that 1005 file, we recommend you spin them at a speed at 300 RPMs in a 1.8 torque. Every other file in the system, we recommend 400 RPMs and 2.5 torque. And we talk about this light pecking motion. Well, you know, what is this light pecking motion? Well, I know you guys are all thinking the same thing I'm thinking, especially if you've got kids. You're looking at this and saying, how fast can I get these up? And they're still good, right? Because we've all been there. I'm not wasting five bucks on fries and a sandwich. So I think in terms of three seconds, I got about three seconds to get these puppies up and still enjoy them because, you know, I've got five kids. Trust me, a little dirt won't hurt anybody. But I want you to think in terms of a three second motion. When I talk about this, what I'm talking about is this, this up and down motion. So I go in with a file, I get a little resistance, one, 1,000, two, 1,003, and then I take the file out a little bit. I don't take it all the way out of the case. I just get it out of resistance. And then I go back in, one, 1,002, 1,003, and out. And one, 1,002, 1,003, and out. And I do that for about three or four passes. Take my file out, I wipe it off, and irrigate. And then I go back in, one, 1,002, 1,003. And that's just that slow motion that I have, because it's not a race. But more importantly, I want you to think in terms of how much pressure to put on your file. If we've all played with mechanical pencils, because, you know, that's just our life. We know how much pressure it takes to break the lead on a mechanical pencil. What I'm gonna tell you is don't put so much pressure on your file tips, you break the mechanical pencil lead. So always keep that in your mind. You know, not so much pressure to break the lead, so don't break my lead, okay? What's, what's really nice about the EDMs, they're pre-sterilized, they're you know, based upon how you, how you get them. You can either buy, you know, Practitioners either get them in kits, you know, treatment kits, or they're, they're a system type of a design. Myself as an endodontist, you know, I know what I want to use, so I just buy them one size per package, and that works great in my hands. But you can get a shaping set, you can get them in finishing sets, you can get them all by themselves. For, you can get a whole box of nothing but 4004s or a whole box of the one files. Just whatever works for you, but they're all modular that you can tear them apart, they're all pre-sterilized, they're all ready to go. And of course, they're available in, you know, the 25 and 21 links. And 21s are great for, you know, when Mrs. Smith doesn't want to open a whole lot, you, of course, are trying to get to the, you know, the second upper molar and you can't get around that curve because she doesn't want to open. So you can pre-bend that file and sneak it around the curve. So that's where 21s are great. I like to use a lot of 25s myself because I do everything underneath the microscope and I can see the shaft with the, with the laser etchings on the, that. So I don't use my stoppers all the time because I, I look at the shaft to see where the etched mark, markings are, 18, 19, 20, 22, and, and I know exactly where I'm at in my cases. I get asked this all the time. What's the best, you know, where do I finish this to? You know, do I take it to a 20, 30, or 40? Again, you're the clinician. You're the one. Every case is different. I, every single one of my cases in, in my office are different. And you'll know by feel engaging the file in the canal. Is it big? Is it small? Can I go smaller? Can I go larger? Younger kids, you got to remember they're bigger. You're going to have to finish them up a little bit bigger. You know, old, you know, 78-year-old Mrs. Smith, you know, those are a little tighter. They're a lot smaller. You don't have to nearly always finish those up as big. So these are just cases. Things that I show, they're always my cases, but I just kind of want you to see some of the things that you can do with these files. You know, what's unique on the meso root, you can see where I can maintain the double S curve, you know, on the MB root system that, you know, um, it just is so hard to control with generations one, two, and three. You know, again, a younger, a younger patient, but look at that double S shaped curve on the mesial root system. This is all done with EDM files. Very easy. I stay centered, you know, a little thinner root there in the front. So, you know, these are finished more to 20 on the mesials just because of that little sexy S shaped curve. And then there's a 4004 in the distal. So, with that being said, that kind of concludes what I want to talk to you about. You know, there's a Facebook group out there that's called High Flex EDM, it's a public group. 
It's a uh, EDM CM files, I think is the name of it. If you want to see cases or post cases or ask questions, this is an international page. There's, I, there's thousands of people in this forum that are all over the world from Italy to Japan to, you know, India, here in the States, Canada, they're all over. And if, so if you want to join that group, you can, you can definitely put in a request. And uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn the time back over to Nick and, um, you know, I'll make myself available for questions and hopefully, you know, it makes some sense to you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Gray. I appreciate it. Um, could you just go back to the slide with the, the sequence on it again? That one that you had, um, it was like yeah, maybe like six slides back or so, the whole sequence. The whole sequence again? Yeah, that one. Uh, I think it was the one before this. Yeah, this one here. Um, so for these guys in particular, I think um, most people that what we're going to be using is people are going to be using the orifice opener, that 2512, um, and then hand filing usually to, um, what do you usually suggest to hand file to, to like a 15 or a 20 or? 15 at a minimum. Um, you know, if you read a lot of the research, it wants you to get you up to a 20. The key difference in hand filing, remember there's a, a there's a big difference in stiffness of a stainless steel file between the 20 and a 25. Once you hit 25, they become less flexible. So, um, you know, my hands, you know, I take mine up to a 15, but you got to remember I've been, I've been at this game 30 years. So, um, you know, I can, I'm very comfortable taking my hand files with 15 and that's why I pick up the 20. You know, I, I bypass the 10 quite a bit. If I, if I get my, um, working link file with a hand file up to a 15 or a 20, it's very mm -hmm. easy. And then I can take one less file out of the system that, you know, and this, that's just me. Um, you know, I'm not telling you to run out and do that uh, because it takes experience to, to make those clinical calls. But yeah, you always want to, me personally, I always start with an eight. And the reason I start with an eight file is for canal mapping. And so you got to go back to Charlie Jerome's studies in the, um, in the early um, uh, mid nineties. And Charlie found that if you went in with a, uh, an eight file and you put it in and basically got it to your working link because that file is so flexible. When you take it out of the case, that file shape will mimic the canal system. So you can actually kind of see what the inside of the internals of your canal will look like. So that's why I use an eight all the time. It's a little more challenging on a 10 because the 10's a little stiffer. So in my hand personally, it's always eight, 10, 15. Okay. I know that's always like, uh, that's kind of like best practice always to, to hand file to that. Um, just, I have a quick question just, as well. Don't, for, uh, don't forget your, what we taught you in dental school. There's a reason we teach you sequences. And, and, and sometimes we tend to forget some of the things that we, we learn, but they're very important steps. And, and the most important step of any endodontic therapy is the initial scouting with a hand file, 8, 10, and 15. Know what your anatomy looks like, feel the resistance, see what kind of calcification you have. And that's, that's the most important stage in, in the entire process is those first three initial hand files. Okay. Uh, we, just have a, we have a quick question as well in the, in the chat. So does this system have a gutta perca specialized for sizes or do we use regular gutta perca? So uh, with, the, with the gutta percha, what you basically do is, I always say regardless of whose file system that you use, the manufacturers of all these different files have their own matching gutta percha on the marketplace. And I always use the matching gutta percha that goes to my file system. So if I'm going to use the EDM file system, then I use the matching EDM gutta percha to coincide with that. But it's really important that you understand that each piece of gutta percha that's on the market is not machine made. And so each is a little different in sizes, whether you want to admit it or not. And so sometimes I can try to fit my gutta percha and I might go through three or four of them to get the exact fit I'm looking for. But we all tend to grab the first one and, and, and try to put it in and, and make that one work. Uh, so don't be bashful. You know, you have to kind of go through the systems. I, I use predominantly uh, uh, the spectra, um, you know, to match up when I'm using the EDM system. Yeah, and we're, this is uh, this is something we're gonna we're gonna have for you guys as well. Um, we've uh, worked that out with uh, kind of like the internal team. We're gonna have um, specifically for that um, for the shaping file, that one file. Um, that one has it starts at an 08 and it turns into an 04 taper, about five millimeters up. Um, so that one has uh, like a, like Dr. Gray said, a variable taper on it. 
Um, that one is uh, kind of like it has like a specialized shape for the gutta percha, which uh, which we'll we're showing you guys as well, um, as well as um, as you can see in the system as well for like the finishing files. Um, I know I was talking to one of the uh, one of the doctors who was saying that she usually finishes with um, for the wave one. She usually finished with the I believe you said the green file, which would be equivalent to the 4004 for our optional files. So we'll have the gutta percha for you guys for that stuff as well for 04, 03. Um, so as you can see, kind of like in this, like in the diagram here that uh, Dr. has, like most of the time, about 80, 90% of cases, you'll be using those three files. So the uh, access opener, uh, that glide path, and then the shaping file, the one file, which is the one that's pretty much gonna be doing all the work for you. Um, similar to how you guys use the, um, the primary file for the wave one. And then there's also the accessory files as well. Um, so if you see at the bot in that bottom, um, you see the bottom files there. There's one to the 2005 yellow. Um, that one almost would be equivalent to the yellow one that you guys use with the wave one as well for smaller cases. Um, I know as well, uh, Dr. Ray, you use this one specifically for um, curved canals as well, right? Because sometimes you just have a hard time getting around that bend, right? Say that one to me again. Um, for the 2005 file, um, when do you typically uh, use that one? I use that on every single case. Okay. So realistically, as you go through the system, you know, if you're going to compare wave versus EDM versus other systems, the two most important files and the files that you take the most time with, in my mind, are the glide path file and the 2005, the, the preparation file. These two files by themselves, just take your time with them in the sense that they're the important because this is what's really creating a good glide path for the rest of the files to follow. So you've got to take your time. I spend the most time on all of my cases realistically with the 2005 file. That's uh, for majority of my cases. That's my first file into the case. I just take my time with it. It's not a race because I know that as soon as I get my 25, my prep file to link, what I actually do with it is I get it to my working link. And then I just kind of lightly pump it so I'm working the apical one third of that. And when I feel least resistance and I feel like it's, I'm able to move the, the preparation file in and out of the canal system to working link with very little resistance, then that's when I switch and I put my, my one file in. And traditionally that one file will go to link pretty quick. And again, I work it that apical one third till there's a little, till there's least resistance. And then I finish mine with a 4004 and that 4004 goes boop working like that quick i work it just a little bit and i'm done it doesn't take me long to shape a canal system the key that you have to remember is you got to keep adequate bleach in the system because you can over you can you can almost get too fast cleaning these and if you're too fast you're not given enough touch time for the sodium hypochloride to be within the canal system to dissolve you know uh, your byproducts your endotoxins your pulp tissue whatever might be there so if you're going too quick, you know, you got to give some bleach time to it. And I'm, I'm going to tell you point frank, I'm, I'm a, a full strength guy. I don't believe in dilution. You know, I know the research on it. I've read all of it from the studies. I know why the, the, the solutions were diluted. And if you really knew why they were diluted, you'd be at full strength too. But I use full strength and, and that just gives me less contact time. And it just works faster and better and more efficient in my book. Awesome. Quick tip for uh, irrigation as well. I like it. Um, just uh, another question as well in the chat. Um, so regarding the heat treatment of these files during sterilization, um, is there a specific recommended temperature and time to follow? So I don't know if uh, I personally don't um, know this question, but I know it's in the manufacturing in case for use. Um, and we'll send you guys all like the details and whatnot of how this can how to sterilize and all that. But do you know off the top of your head by chance, Dr. Gray or? Well, you, realistically, you can't change the temperature on your, your autoclave machines. So that's perfect. That's, that's, that will regenerate the file at those autoclave temperatures. And so, um, you know, just a normal autoclave. Now, I'll tell you what I do not do is I do not put my files in any type of ultrasonic unit, okay? And the reason I don't do that is, is I don't want different metals working against each other. And what happens, especially with generations one, two, and three, if you put those kinds of files in an ultrasonic system, and then you have stainless steel files, or you have, you know, other 
in dental instruments in there, the metallurgy kind of freaks out a little bit and you'll actually will have a higher separation rate of files if you put them through autoclaves. And that's just after 30 years of doing this. So my files, my, my, my stainless steel files, my, my rotary files, they never see an ultrasonic uh, device. So that helps in my mind, increase the longevity of files. Okay, that's, uh, that's good to know, thank you. Um, also, this is, uh, this is another question that I want to, uh, I get pretty often I've got from uh, some of the, uh, some of the doctors over to the corner as well. Um, do you have any, I know this is a little bit of a slippery slope as well when bringing this up, um, but do you have a certain amount of canals that you recommend that you can do per case? Like as I know this is a little bit of a slippery slope of like a question, I, but always something that comes up. I always say you're the clinician. You make that, dis that, that determination. I do not count files and try to remember things. I'm just too darn busy to do that. But I do mark my files in such a way that I know how many times I've used them. And so my marking system that I use is that if you look at the shanks of these uh, files, brand new, they're going to look gold. And so I always know that if I look at a gold top, if I look at the top of my rotary instrument where I'm going to insert that file into the handpiece, if the top of that file is gold, I know it's a brand new file. I've not used it in any case. If I use it in a case, my staff know to clean the files and then they take a red Sharpie permanent marker and they color just the top of the file and they color it in red. So that way, and I have a file storage system in my drawers that I store my files into when they come out of the autoclave. So if I look down in my drawer and I see gold files, I know they're brand new. If I see red top files, I know I've used them in one case. If I use a red file and I use it in a third case, then I take a, um, or if I'm going to use them a third time, they'll, the staff will, will color the top of the red with a black Sharpie. So now if I look down, I see gold, I see red, I see black. So I know gold's brand new, red I've used them in one case, and black means I've used them in two cases. Now, I pick and choose what files I'm gonna use based upon the complexity of my cases. Now, I'm an endodontist and I get everybody's crap. So what that means is I'm gonna get the more challenging cases than what you traditionally would get in a general office. And so if I get that gift, you know, where the canals are open up enough that I can drive a truck down them, then, you know, I may use a red one. You know, I may use my black ones on straight canals when I get that rare anterior or maybe that rare bicuspid. But for the majority of my cases, you know, I go back and forth. I use a lot of golds because I have a lot of calcified curved canals. If I have a really curse, if I have an older patient that's calcified curved, I guarantee it's going to be a gold file. It's going to be a brand new file every time. If I have a case that has got minimal curving, it's not quite a bunch of calcification. I'm very comfortable using a file that's, you know, has been colored in with the top of it red. You know, that's why I say you're the clinician, you have to pick and choose. If you're gonna grab a, a black file and use it on, you know, Mrs. Smith who's 85 and highly calcified and highly curved, I guarantee you, you're gonna separate the file. So that may not be the wisest choice. Again, you may wanna make sure the files are new on those types of cases. Okay, thank you. Um, Usman, we have another question that Jay says, great lecture and very helpful tips, Dr. Gray. I uh, just wanted to ask if, if uh, or just wanted to ask, what is your disinfection protocol before final drying and obturation? Um, so for you specifically in your practice, is there anything specific that you do or, because I know this is all in like the indication for use as well, but. Um, I just, I just follow the protocols of endodontics. So, you know, uh, that's really in itself, you know, if we do a hands-on, we can go through all of the irrigation and how to do it and how to do it properly. But again, I keep sodium hypochlorite in my canals the entire time. You know, I dry them before I, you know, before I, I can condense my gutta percha in a case. Um, you know, whether or not I use chlorhexidine or if I use, you know, um, EDTA, you know, I typically always want to remove the smear layer, but you know, that's, that that's in itself of it. Uh, there's a technique to it. Most of us have learned it in dental school, and um, that's something we definitely can cover on a hands-on type of a thing. You know, my whole key is, is just make sure you've got bleach in the case the entire time. Don't don't ever put a, a file spinning in a case that doesn't have some type of solution in the chamber because that solution is your lubrication. 
And, and if, if you're doing it dry, then you're going to run a higher risk of separation. Awesome. Um, I don't know if there's any more uh, questions in the chat. Oh, okay. We've got a, another question. Actually, I was just about to, uh, I was just about to actually ask this one because this is one I get, or I got from Dr. Sally as well. Um, so thanks, Dr. Gray, for the informative lecture. Just wondering if these files are available in 31 millimeter length. Um, so I can, answer, I can partially answer that question. So um, the EDM ones are not. Um, we have a, so the previous generation files, the Hyflex CM, um, those ones are, um, but I know 31, um, it's very, very rare that you get a case where it's uh, the, where you actually need like a, a 31 millimeter uh, file. But uh, doctor, I know for like, there are some, obviously there are some like larger teeth out there um, that do come yeah. up. Um, you know, uh, can you talk about kind of changing your reference point and how you do uh, that? And, and that's the whole, that's the whole secret here. I mean, first of all, I've never had a molar in 30 years. that's been 31 length millimeter. Um, now I've had a bicuspid at 27. Um, but you know, I realistically, the average working length, you know, on your molars are going to be 20, 21, but where I get those longer cases, they're going to be predominantly, you know, an anterior tooth and those are straight cases. So if you really think about it, I, I have the CM files just for that purpose because I can get them longer at 31. I can also get them larger sizes. I mean, I can get a 6004 in a CM. Now, I told you guys earlier that a lot of times I take the stoppers off of my files and I do everything underneath the microscope. Well, this is really a good question. I'm gonna actually go to this next picture. So if I, does that isolate the screen? Can everybody see a, a, a white circle? Yeah, I think I can see it, so I think everybody can. Perfect. So I'm gonna use this 4004. So with this white, if I take that stopper off, first of all, you can see where it's 18. So look at my, look at my, my uh, cursor, 18, 19, and 20 is right underneath of that cursor. If I take this stopper off, I know at the base of that, that is going to be 21. I'm trying to get this to the work. But you also will notice that there is a bevel on that shaft right there. That's a half a millimeter bevel. If I need 21 and a half, I can take it to that line there. And if I need it to 22, I can go to that line there. So these are all things that I look at underneath my microscope. And so the same rules apply when I'm with a 25 length and maybe I've got a 27, I can either take it to where the color banding is at my reference point, or I can change my reference point. The problem is with reference points is we typically use the incisal edge because we can see it. Well, I do everything underneath the microscope. So a lot of my reference points are the actual orifice opening where I make my access. And so that wall going down right at that point where I make the access, I use that, that, that uh, surface of where the hole starts. And that's where I use a lot of my reference points. So if I, on a lingual surface, that might realistically only be 22 millimeters. And so therefore I can typically get a case where you'd say, oh, it's 27. Well, because it's 27, because I'm measuring way up the size of the ledge. But if I change my reference point down to the bottom of the orifice opening, then that might take five or four millimeters off of it. And so therefore, that's where I change my reference point. And then a lot of times I can see my, the markings of the file go right to that point. And I'll use that and I don't even pay attention to the incisal edge. So there's all kinds of ways to get around it. But, you know, I, in my hands, because I don't get a lot of cherry cases, um, I think I've used 31 files twice, you know, all of last year. <laughs> so I don't get a big call for 31 length. Yeah, it's, uh, that's always something I, uh, I feel like uh, that I get asked uh, a bit about the, uh, the 31 length. Um, and I always forget about being able to change your reference point. I know that's uh, my question. I'm glad you're here to answer because it's a lot more technical than um, usually I can go into. Um, but we've got a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, so Obadabaru says, thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, you said you use the 4004 in a lot of canals. Yep. Uh, do you use them also in small canals like MB and lower molars, for yep. example, or do we stop with one file? No, uh, I, use, 
I routinely take a lot of my lower molars to a 4004 because the difference, the difference between the one file and the 4004 is very minimal. And so you've got to also take into account where you do your training. So Southern Cal is an apical stock preparation school. That's what we live and breathe on. That's what was ingrained upon us from day one. And that's still how I practice dentistry today. I'm not real wild about a continuous taper like Buchanan would teach where you just kind of take a feather tip and shove it in there and try to mimic, you know, this taper. Uh, I like something solid. That's just me personally. Um, I always say stick with what your schools teach you. But the transition and to go from the 25 and just take that 4004 to, to length one more time takes me seconds to do because there's so little difference in the taper of these files. And so it compensates extremely well. And let's, let's face it, you know, if you send a case to an endodontist, all of the endodontists out there, we kind of want to send a case back to the referring office with a consistent look. So that when you look at this case, you'll go, oh, that's Dr. Gray's case, or that's Dr. Smith's case. You can tell by looking at them and, 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 and how, you know, they're point on every time. And that's what we pride ourselves into. That's what we beat ourselves up for. So we're going to constantly try to create that same sexy look, same sexy shape. And in my hands, that's what I found I get more consistent with. Because as an endodontist, it's all about consistency. And it's all about returning a good product back to you that you can feel comfortable. I would really, me personally, I would be a little uncomfortable if you did a lot of crown and bridge work on a minimally prepared case. Okay. I think that, uh, I think that answers that. Um, one more question to chat. Uh, Aba5, or I appreciate this Dr. Aba, who I met a few weeks ago. Hey, Dr. Aba. Um, how do the high flex files function in ProGlide? Does ProGlide or RC prep reduce their cutting efficacy? Not really. So how is it that we use RC prep and how does it we use ProGlide? You got to remember, this is a, a, a viscous chelator. And so we're really utilizing these two particular products for lubrication. Now, there's a difference between ProGlide and RC prep. I will tell you point blank, I am not an RC prep fan. And that has to do with Marwan Abaros' studies in the mid 70s that basically says RC prep has carbo wax in it. And when you try to remove the RC prep out of the internal uh, structures of the case, there's 26% of the wax is still left behind in the case by using RC prep. ProGlide has no carbo wax in it. Therefore, I feel more comfortable because I'm using a product that has no wax in it that I do not want to leave behind. To me personally, I think RC Prep is old school. The Pro Glides, the Pro Lubes, you know, uh, there's another really, there's a, a, a Micro Mega has this MTA paste that is phenomenal. Um, I used to use Pro Glide all the time. I love this Micro Mega's uh, product, this, uh, this MTA paste. Or, or EDTA paste, and uh, it's just creamier. And so you're, you're really utilizing that type of a thing. I use it for scouting. I use it when I've got a little bit more tissue resistance. That viscous EDTA is phenomenal for breaking down really tenacious tissue that just you can't seem to get out sometimes. I can put a little uh, that, that uh, EDTA paste and I use my my uh, preparation file, which is that 2005, it's like butter. It goes right down the length. It blasts through that tissue. Uh, but that's what I use. So it, there's no change in cutting efficiency. It actually enhances it, in my opinion. I don't use it the entire case because I would rather have bleach in the case working than trying to chelate things as I'm, go as I'm going along. Okay. I think you're, uh, you're teasing us a little bit with the, the micro mega. I don't think we have that in Canada, oh, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Then the pro loops, I, I like the pro loops. That's what I've used for use for years, just because it doesn't have any of that. But, you know, um, hopefully you guys will, Micro Mega will get up there. It's an, it's a, it's a company out of France. Uh, phenomenal stuff. Um, I'm seeing, like I said, that, that uh, EDTA paste, uh, you know, I got my hands on some of it when I went to Vienna last year for the endodontic meeting and 
wow, that just changed the way I, I use that EDTA. Yeah, I know whenever you go to these international shows, you kind of have to put a bunch of pot products in a, in a bag and hopefully you can uh, get them over the border because uh, they have uh, yeah. some better products over in, uh, over in, I know you guys have some better products in the States and then over in, in Europe there, that's where the, the really. Uh, and I have, I have the same problem trying to bring stuff back from Europe into the States. So. You know. <laughs> that gets a little difficult. Um, <laughs> so that's the, uh, the last of the questions that um, I have for like common questions that I've gotten from other doctors as well. Mm. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the chat has any last questions or anything or uh, we'll yeah, and, if, and if you do have questions, you know, just go up to the top, unmute yourself and just throw it out there. You know, this is your time. It's not a big deal because uh, this is all for you guys. So if, if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, throw the question out there. There's, there's never a dumb question. Yeah, I think everybody just wants the, rock, <laughs> the last bit of the Laker Houston match. Yeah, that's uh, that's very. Laker, good. Lakers are up 103.90. They're blowing them out. Well, as long as the I don't know, it just it depends who the Raps are in the against in the finals, right? When they win the when the next game, I guess. That's yeah, what you know, I'm I'm from LA, so I, my Lakers have got to do something. <laughs> well, uh, we'll be cheering for that for that battle, that's for sure. But uh, if there's no other questions, guys. Um, hey, it was great chatting with all you guys. I really loved all the all the questions. We had some really good ones here for sure. Um, I'm going to be coming around and I'll probably be visiting uh, quite a few of you. And if you guys have any uh, questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be sending out my com uh, my contact information to all you guys. Um, we can forward some questions on to Dr. Gray if you have uh, yeah. any super specific questions that I might not be able to handle. Um, yeah. And we'll also be sending you guys a, a guide as well for how to, I guess, go through the files and when to use what. Um, ultimately, we just want to make it simple for you guys, and hopefully this um, lecture kind of helped out with that. Um, but uh, if there's any specific, just, uh, just let me know. Uh, Dr. Gray, what are you saying, sorry? I was going to say, and this, this will be fun. Once we get past the 14-day quarantine where I can come up north, then, you know, we can, we can spend some time. We can really play with these files, and we can give it a little different type of a lecture that really kind of throws it all together. It, uh, it gives you from A to Z on how to really become a little more proficient in endodontic therapy. Uh, this is just kind of a metallurgy tease you. Um, but I think that once you start utilizing the file systems, like I said, for me, I have six or seven different file systems in my drawer that I use, but pretty much today, 98% of what I do is EDM files. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really great to hear. I know, uh, I know it's, um, I had Adam also asking me, she's like, she's like, can we do a hands-on? And I know you were also saying like, oh, like every time I talk to you, like, I'd really love to go and do a hands-on with all those guys. It'd be really fun. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, oh, it's, I don't know if we can make it work right now, but uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get it going for all you guys as soon as we uh, as soon as we possibly can because uh, lectures like this over Zoom are are all good and they can be informative. But um, I know that you learn the most when you're uh, when you're actually doing the stuff and, and feeling it and all that. So, um, but with that, I just wanna like I said, I just wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight for joining us. Uh, Bad mom, if you have any last things you need to say or anything like that, or if we're good to close the call. Nope. Or, no, I just like to thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Gray, yeah. and um, Nick. Thank you for being available. Um, yeah. So if anybody wants to reach you, Nick, um, I guess you'll make yourself available, and you'll introduce yourself, and then they can reach you whenever they need to. Yeah. I'll. Uh, so like I said, I'll send out my comp, uh, my contact info to. Uh, you already have it, but I'll send that line to Dr. Sally as well, and just like I said, okay. all the. It'll have my my number, email, all that, but also like all the steps for how to use the file, um, sterilization, stuff like that. Just like a general guide um, to get you guys through those like first cases. It could be, like I said, there's always a, there's always a learning curve, but um, I think it's in terms of steps, it's pretty similar to what you guys are using in terms of like a one file system. Of course, sometimes you're gonna be going to the larger files or the smaller ones, like with the 4004 um, in, turn, in, in the place of like the green file or using the yellow, our yellow file place of that one. Um, but I think you guys will, you guys will get it. You guys will really enjoy it using it after you kind of get going with it. Um, but yeah, with that, perfect. yeah, I'll, uh, I'll close with the call. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll yield my time, I guess, and I'll let everyone go to bed. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Dr. Sally, did you want to say anything or are we I just wanted to thank Dr. Gray and Nick for the informative lecture and thank everyone who attended and, uh, Fatima, you were recording for the ones who are still busy at work. Yes, for, yeah. for the poor ones who are still meant for. still working tonight. That's crazy. No, yeah. thank you for your time and looking forward uh, to collaborating together.
You got it. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Graham. Thank you. Good night. Good night.